Hi everyone, I'm Matt Thomas. I'm the Executive Director of the Paseo Project and I'm delighted to welcome you here at the Taos Center for the Arts uh, for our artist talk for our May 2023 artist in residence, Ruben Olyun. Um, the Paseo Project transforms community with art and art with community. And in addition to our annual festival, the Paseo, we host artists throughout the spring, summer, and fall to execute projects that are uh, community inspired and socially engaged. We have three artists in residence this year. Um, today we will hear from Ruben. Uh, he is our second artist of the season. I want to thank the Lore Foundation for their generous support for our artists in residence education programs this year. Um, thank you as well to the J3 Fund and the New Mexico Arts for their support. And we couldn't do this without the generosity from the Taos community. Revolt Gallery for their sponsorship and space for Ruben's studio. Uh, Kathy Sanders for housing Ruben this month and additional thanks to our interns for a print scene with Ruben this month, uh, Kalila, Josefina, Sawyer, Carson, Darian, and Luna. And thank you to the TCA here for hosting us today. Thank you, Chelsea, Dan uh, Danny, and Travis. In addition to this talk, uh, we actually have a wonderful lineup of events uh, for the next two weeks uh, while Ruben is in town. Um, next Saturday, we actually have two events. Uh, it starts off at uh, Twirl, for their um, artist art studio workshop for kids, and that's at noon. And then head over to the Taos Library at 3 p.m. And Ruben will be set up there um, in ho uh, hosting a local history workshop at 3 p.m. And then on Wednesday the 31st, we'll be in Kit Carson Park right over here, two to six for the Family and Children Health Day uh, with 100% Community. And please join us for Ruben's final piece. It's a pop-up projection. It'll be downtown. Uh, it's Friday evening, June 2nd, 7.30 or around sunset. There'll be up to maybe nine projections throughout the entire uh, area. We'll release all the details as we get closer to the date. That's Friday evening, June 2nd, and that's free um, and open to the public. And you can check out our website or follow us on social media for all the details. And we actually have in um, a couple of the schedules here sitting on the benches for people. Okay, it's been a pleasure again to have Ruben here in town. So Ruben has been a two-time Paseo um, Festival artist. In 2015, he presented Sonic Decay. It was an interactive sound installation with wood and adobe. And then in Paseo 2019, he returned as an Asakia Key artist uh, with Implied Line. And it was a mapping and research projection uh, installation that you might have seen. And we're delighted to have him here for a longer period of time this time around. For three weeks, Ruben is looking at the hidden history of water in our community with his project, uh, Benitas de Aguas. Um, over the years, we've hosted artist interventions that are looking at issues of infrastructure, mobility, environment, and climate change. Benitas de Aguas explores the rich history of water in our community, the many stories that water inhabits, and the importance of bringing people together to discuss these important issues. Art has a way of breaking down barriers, opening up conversations, and exploring new futures. Ruben's been busy meeting with local uh, leaders, researchers, community members, water advocates, and we invite you on Friday, uh, June 2nd, to see the projections and what he discovered and uh, collected. And now to introduce Ruben. Uh, Ruben Olguin is a New Mexico-based artist working in ceramics, adobe, sound, video, and electronic media. His work draws from his mixed indigenous American and Spanish mezzo heritage. He incorporates traditional hand processes of earth, earthen materials with modern elements. Uh, he spends as much time in the desert as he does in the computer lab. He has exhibited internationally in the US, Spain, and Germany. He's a graduate of the MFA from uh, the University of New Mexico Department of Fine Arts in, in Fine Arts in Electronic Arts and holds a BA in Media Art from the University of New Mexico. And uh, he is currently a professor of digital arts at Florida Southwestern State College. Uh, please help me welcome Ruben Olguin. Thank you, Matt. That was great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening to talk a little bit about art and sort of the history of water and what I've been up to with this residency here in my time. Um, I've been doing a lot and I've been very busy and I've met a lot of the community members and I have some previous associations with some of the community here in Taos from previous projects and 
associations that I've been affiliated with out here. So it is very much feels like a homecoming coming out here. I've been in Florida for the last 10 months um, teaching digital arts out there. So it feels really nice coming home to New Mexico and, you know, getting my feet back in the mud again. So um, thank you all for hosting me. Thank you to Paseo for inviting me and allowing me to um, take part in this experience. So the project that I'm doing um, here for the Paseo is called Vignetas de Aguas. It's about little vignettes, little stories, hidden histories of water throughout the Taos Valley. And um, I'm gonna explain a little bit like specifically about what the project is gonna be about a little bit later. But first to sort of introduce the kind of work that I do and the kind of artwork that I've made in the past. Um, so I graduated from UNM with my MFA in 2015, where I had my thesis exhibition, um, Broken Landscapes. And um, this work really was sort of the synthesis of thinking about the histories of New Mexico, the histories of people, and um, the politics of identity, which really I looked towards myself and internally, and sort of the conflicts of the different histories and heritages that a lot of us that are sort of native New Mexicans have out here and thought about how that has reflected in a lot of ways. This work here was called Fractured Broken Landscapes and it, they were sculptural pieces that had video projections inside of them. So I handmade these adobes, uh, adobe bricks that were um, clay and sand that was harvested from different regions here in New Mexico. And I built these adobes and turned them into like a bowl and uh, inside of them, I plastered them sort of smooth on the inside and then projected video on top of that. And this really started my thought and thought processes around the fracturing of landscapes and how our um, histories and legacies of splitting up and segmenting the land affects the people and affects the flow of resources throughout the region. Um, Songs of Our Fathers was uh, another work that was sort of an expansive piece that had multiple different outputs and umbrellas. And it was really considering the sound landscape and how the divisions of land in our region um, have been divided and subdivided. And what is, how has that affected the soundscape of the region, right? If any of us know you can't go anywhere in Taos without hearing traffic, right? That's not unique. You can't go anywhere in the world without hearing trains or airplanes or, you know, traffic, highways, trucks, all of those kinds of things. It's a prevalent everywhere that you go. And so this sort of, this body of work explored how the divisions and the histories of divisions of land in this region has affected the sonic landscape that we're living in and how that affects the indigenous communities as well. So in this works, I created these pottery pieces and uh, these potteries are uh, hand gathered clay, sort of wild clay that I gathered, processed, and I made these vessels and each of these vessels are considered resonators, so they hold a specific sound frequency inside of them. So these larger ones hold like deeper sound frequencies and the smaller ones will hold higher pitch frequencies, similar to like a seashell. If you were to put a seashell up to your ear and you hear the little hum that comes from that, that's because seashells are technically resonators. So that sort of was the inspiration of this pottery. And so um, I identified specific frequencies in different areas along migration routes um, in New Mexico and found where like the certain keystone frequencies of that region would be and made pottery that would help isolate those frequencies, the mechanical frequencies of that area. The image you see up here on the top um, is the Atchison Topeka Railroad as it crosses through the middle of Albuquerque. On the other side is the Angostura Diversion Channel just outside San Felipe and Bernalillo near the Santa Ana Pueblo. And uh, I went out there in the wild and set up my pottery and recorded the sound as it was going through. And this sound exploration of the landscape led to other projects as well. I did a tape that is um, available for sale. Um, if you go to my website, you can find links to that. So Echoes Through the Desert is a project that I explored with the same pottery going to different locations and thinking about how sound has affected that environment and not just the open air sound, but also like what is the sound of the music that's in the area, the frequencies that are um, being bounced around the landscape, right? All of these hidden frequencies that are there. And so I recorded those and I um, also recorded the live sound through the pottery and then did some mixing on top of that. So that way each piece of sound was then folding on top of the other. I'll play a little bit for you. I don't know if we can hear it on Facebook, but.
So you can hear sort of the eerie landscape that was derived by putting the microphones in sort of those ends. The traffic drives by, it isolates the frequency of the motor noise and the whirring and whirzing of mechanical noise in the environment. This piece here, um, this is a body of work called Traces. And uh, these were um, Pueblo inspired bowls that were designed in the traditional and built in the traditional Pueblo way. Again, hand harvested clay that was pit fired. And each of these bowls were designed in a specific shape that was relative to the traditional heritages that these works were deriving from. Um, so they were looking at a kind of bowl that the Pueblos use in pottery called a puki. And the puki is sort of the vessel that they use to make all the other vessels. It's sort of the base that's used when you're making Pueblo pottery. And so I decided to use that as a visual medium unto itself, rather than sort of a secondary medium to making something else. And so I made a series of these pukis and I use them as projection surfaces. So um, each of these bowls are not painted. Those are projectors that are projecting video inside of the bowls. Um, so I've been dealing with this, you know, relationship between projection and the natural earth and the histories of different regions. Um, these pieces in particular, we're looking at the history of archaeology and anthropology here in New Mexico and the ownership of images. So it looked at the history at the turn of the century in the 19, in the late 1900s. There was this mass sort of uh, influx of archaeologists and anthropologists that came to New Mexico and did a lot of extraction of the culture, a lot of extraction of the resources that were here and sort of ignored a lot of the, the way that those uh, resources were used by the local indigenous communities. And so they took a lot of stuff out of there, including a lot of the images and iconography and tried to dissect them and develop meaning from them in ways that were not the ways that the Pueblos would derive meaning from them. And in outside of the relationship of the Pueblos to that historical imagery and the context of how that works. And so they saw these images as sort of monolithic, representing a larger heritage and having larger symbolic meaning and having all of these things without any inputs from the Pueblos themselves as to what they thought those things meant. And so they wrote books and they published imagery. And so what I did, and this is my first foray really into like deep research, for arts practice. And so I spent a lot of time at the um, Center for Southwest Research at the University Library in Albuquerque. And I found the original manuscripts of these archeologists and I literally stole the images out of the book, right? So these books are from the 1900s. The original copies are open domain because they didn't copyright books in the same way as they do today back then. But if you were to go online and find a digital copy, those images are copywritten. So I had to find the original source material in order to legally rip that stuff out of those books. So I stole the images and then I remapped them back onto their original surfaces, recontextualizing those images in their original formats. The other thing I do here is I'm overlaying the different images on top of each other to prevent any kind of linear monolithic thinking of what the images would be. So allowing the images to breathe between each other and allowing them to fold and open and close beyond each other, reflecting the evolution of imagery that's used in Pueblo pottery as this sort of evolution and synthesis of time and relationship with different families and different potters and the different uh, uh, sort of times that they were produced, right? Because a lot of this work, we consider it as sort of historical. A lot of this stuff really was contemporary painting techniques that they were using. And so um, bringing that in and allowing these to live in their original context. Some of my more recent work, um, this is a series of pottery, again, dealing with vessels of frequency that are holding noise. These pieces are called anthropogenic frequencies, and these are 3D printed vessels, sound vessels. Um, and so these 3D printed vessels are made out of plant-based plastic and they have a, a wood grain filling inside of it. So they look and smell like wood and they have a texture that's very like, like a sanded wood texture to them. But each of these frequency, each of these vessels holds a frequency that will accelerate germination of seeds. So there's been a lot of reflection of scientists looking at what we call anthropogenic frequencies. So relationships of sounds that humans have created with seeds. And so in the presence of certain frequencies, it will accelerate the germination of certain seeds. 
So um, a lot of these frequencies can be related to human activity or other things such as insect activity around their areas that will trigger the seeds to want to grow. The seeds are listening and there's been a lot of scientific evidence that have proven that seeds can hear the soundscape of the environment above them and can actually respond to sounds that are being placed in their interaction. So all of these frequencies have scientifically proven acceleration rates of germination. Some, in some cases, three to five days accelerated compared to a controlled seed, and in other cases, up to two weeks in accelerated germination and an increase in growth of the initial germ um, that, that was grown out of that as well. And so each of these vessels represents a different frequency that relates to a certain seed. So uh, basil, corn, tobacco, all of these like indigenous seeds can be accelerated through that process. And really this is a relationship between us and the seeds. And what really got me started with this work was corn. When I first started looking at this, one of the first seeds that the scientists were studying was corn. And they found that 330 Hertz was the frequency that accelerated the germination of corn. 330 Hertz also happens to be a similar frequency to the Pueblo drum. So if we think about training and working with and living with and singing to the plants as the Pueblos had done for 6,000 years, have created a relationship with the seed corns. And um, so I did a workshop with the Taos Pueblo or with the Hopi Pueblo during the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And they said one of the things that was really prevalent was the singing and the drumming during planting season in the dryland farms. So this was something that they've been doing for time immemorial. And so they have developed some kind of frequency response with the seeds. So anthropogenic frequencies. The work that is my most recent work that I think relates most to the project I'm doing now is a series called Retablos, where I'm taking this sort of historical look of, of Retablos and the history of the Retablo in this relationship between the Spanish colonial paradigm and the Pueblos and that relationship that happened between that. So um, for those of you that don't know much about the retablos, it was an artistic form that sort of sprang up between the relationship of the indigenous peoples and their colonization and indoctrination into Christianity. And they were sort of a relationship between that where these sort of indigenous ideologies from Mexico all the way through the Southwest were sort of adapted and they created an art form to help relate these sort of indigenous ideologies into Christianity. And it was a way that they used for conversion practices of the indigenous communities. And it became like a life until its own. In New Mexico, there's a huge pride and heritage of retablos here. So I'm taking that similar form. I'm using found wood that has been harvested out of old adobe buildings. I'm taking found tin and doing tin work and tin cutting to help embellish them similarly to what most retablos would be doing. And then the surface of this is actually adobe. So it's adobe clay that I've plastered on the surface of this. And I use hand harvested paints and clays to paint the maps that you see before you. Each of these are um, relative to each of the Pueblos here in the Southwest. And so in the red here, you would see the outline of the Pueblo. In this case, this is for the Laguna Pueblo. And right here, you might be able to see it here. There's a little dot right there, and that represents the mission church that was placed originally at that Pueblo. So what this is looking at is the relationship between the mission churches here in New Mexico and access to water rights with the Pueblos and the surrounding communities. The water rights were always derived and the communities were always built around the mission churches. These were central to everything that the Spanish was doing when they were establishing their colonies here. So the water rights that we see today in our communities are relics of this original process of these monuments of the churches. And so you can see the division of water and how it's being executed surrounding the relationship with the, uh, the Pueblo Mission Churches. So if you mind to geek out a little bit with me about the history of the Taos Valley, um, one of the things I've been doing when I came here was like a lot of research. I spent several days at the libraries here at the Taos Library and at the UNM Taos Library it has a beautiful collection. Um, UNM Taos Library just created a new room called like the Water Room, and it's like dedicated to the history of water and the acequias here in uh, here in Taos and in this in this region. 
Um, it's a beautiful section. It's, I, I highly recommend you all go out to that library. It's a beautiful library. But so they let me into some of their back collections and I dug through some of their archives and have just been doing a lot of research around water, not just humans, but just the geologic history of water here as well. So I'll start pre-human history in the Taos Valley. So the geologic sort of history of the Rio Grande Rift is really the story that dominates how water is distributed and where water exists today in the Taos Valley. Um, originally, the Farallon um, Formation, which was uh, a sort of old um, plate of the plate tectonics, came and collided with the North American plate in around 165 million years ago. And it's through that initial collision that the uplift was created that created the Rocky Mountains and the uplift that we see here with the Taos Mountains. So the, the Farallon Rift came and sort of pushed up against it and created the mountains. And then after its climax, it started to recede back and started to pull away from itself. And that's where we get the Rio Grande Lift, which is technically a divergent boundary, which started around 40 million years ago. So around 40 million years, it already passed the climax and these two tectonic plates started to pull apart from each other, creating the rift that we have now called the Rio Grande Rift. Um, this has also created these folding um, uh, tectonic activity um, in the Picaris area called the Pecos Fault Zone, the Embudo Fault and the Sangre de Cristo Fault, which are all slip faults. And as these, as these faults are pulling away from each other, it's folding up the land around it right at that point. And that's causing the different land masses to sort of rub up against each other, causing different kinds of seismic activity that's happened between there. Around this 40 million years when the rift started to come, that's when the most of the volcanic activity that we see around here was formed as well. So that's a little bit about sort of the plate tectonics. And mind you, I'm not a geologist, but I have studied a little bit of geology and I know how to read the map. So this is really interesting stuff for me looking at this. So in this map here on the side, you can see the, uh, the fault sort of coming up. So this is the Picaris or the Engudo Fault, which comes just to the edge of the Picaris Mountain. And then the San de Cristo Fault, which follows the mountain. And this literally follows the edge of the foothills of the Taos Mountain. And that's really where that sort of plate tectonic activity is coming from. And it's through that tectonic activity that we get our tributaries and the flow of water that we have today. So the Ice Age had a huge impact on how water is distributed here and especially how the underground aquifers are distributed um, in the Taos Valley. And this goes all the way back to the Mesozoic and Cenozoic era. 245 million to about 66 million years ago, New Mexico was mostly underwater, right? It was water, it was ocean. We had beaches here, right? Like this was the beach right through here. Um, and it alternated for various times between ocean and sea, right? And so through those different times, water had managed and settled. And during the Pleistocene era, um, the glaciers started to form, which is around 126,000 years ago. And in the late Pleistocene era, around 11,000 years ago, is when the glaciers started to melt. So that's where the main glaciers in this region started to create the runoff and the mass wasting that we see today. This late Pleistocene, Pleistocene era, um, they actually have fossil records from this area that have been found locally when they built the dam out in Abiquiu. They found mammoth bones, right? They've also found uh, bison bones, which are sort of uh, historical bison related to the buffaloes that we understand today. Um, and also um, uh, camels. They had camels here, sort of uh, late. <laughs> so they found fossils of all of those animals, which are probably animals that the people here hunted as well. It was for a long time believed that the indigenous people in this region came here um, across the Bering Strait at the time that these glacial melts were happening. And so they generally said, you know, the indigenous folks in this area had, um, were originally here around eight to 6,000 um, BCE. Um, but recently, just a few years ago, they found footprints in white sands along what was a historic water, a uh, large river, or sorry, a large lake out there where White Sands used to be a lake. And um, they found footprints that they dated to 22,000 BCE. So they have um, archeological evidence now that the indigenous folks were in these regions as far back as 22,000 years ago. 
So the glacial melting had significant change on the aquifer systems. Most of the large aquifers we have today is water runoff from these um, glacier mountains that came through the different rivers and created new tributaries as the water runoff was happening, creating what's called mass wasting, where it's sort of taking large chunks of land with it and creating new trib tributaries. This is also the time when the Taos Gorge was filled with alluvium sediment from the mass wasting of the glacial forms in uh, southern Colorado. In this map here that you're looking at, these are the major glacial formations at the late Pleistocene era. Um, the B here on the map is the Sancre de Cristo Glacier. And so up here in the mountains, there were several glaciers throughout here that were over 100,000 years old and around 11,000 BC is when they started to melt out and distribute their waters throughout this region and really change the underground hydrology of the area. This is sort of an artist rendering of what this would look like. So this is Southern Colorado, and this is sort of just a graphic that shows how the glacial runoff creates tributaries. So at the foot of the glaciers, when they start to map, they sort of carve out the landscape where it's melting. And all of the tributaries are created, and each of those tributaries sort of form to a central river, which in our area became the Rio Grande. So all of that glacial runoff from Colorado had to go somewhere, it created the Colorado River and the Rio Grande River. So that's sort of the geologic history of water here in Taos. But then we need to get into the people part, right? Because this is where it matters to us, where we are as people and how do we get to the point that we are today and what are some of these influences that have happened. So in the Taos Valley, we break it up into several periods. Um, I have divided here into about six different periods of occupation here in the Taos Valley. 6,000 BCE to 750 CE, there's paleoarchaeological evidence that the Paleo-Indian cultures and the early Anasazi cultures started to occupy this region. So as far as 6,000 years ago, they were actually living here semi-permanently controlling the landscape. 800 to 1598, you have the Pueblo, the Tiwa cultures that sort of settled in this region and started to build their Pueblos here. 1598 to 1821, we consider that the Spanish colonial period. That was the time that this area was occupied under Spanish rule. 1821 to 1848, we have the Mexican period. This is just after the Mexican Revolution, before the Mexican-American War. There was a brief, what is that? 15, 18 year period that this land was actually considered part of Mexico. Then 1848 to 1912 is considered the US territorial period following the, um, the Mexican-American War. It became a territory. And then in 1912, it, New Mexico was, was added as an official state of the US. So 1912 to current is considered the American period. Um, I'm gonna get a little dry here. So major events that had happened. And this is just talking about how these specific events affect the flow of water and how we think about water today. The early Paleo-Indian and Anasazi cultures that were here did have irrigation and dry farming techniques that they practiced out here. There's archeological evidence that they modified the land. They may not have been doing crop farming the way we understand it today, but they understand, they understood where the water was flowing beneath the soil, where the water was flowing on top of the soil, where water would pool and where they can encourage land masses to produce crops that would be to their benefit. And this is where that relationship with corn and all of these other um, invaluable seeds that they developed during this time um, were mostly dry land farming, meaning that they weren't necessarily like building canals and funneling water, but they knew where the water would be, when it would be there, and they were able to modify the areas of land around that. Um, there is a lot of archaeological evidence that the, the late Anasazi cultures, just before the Tiwa cultures and extending through the Tiwa cultures, um, that they created what were called buffalo fields. So out on the Mesa, there was this huge land where there were hundreds of thousands of buffaloes in a giant buffalo herd that lived out here. And when the Spanish explorers came out here and when the American explorers came out here, they thought that this was just wild land, that these buffalo just happened to be here because they were just natural. But really, the Puebloan people had been cultivating the buffalo and the landscape that the buffalo had been grazing on for thousands of years. 
So it wasn't an accident that those buffalo herds were here. It was due to Puebloan activity that the buffalo herds were able to sustain such a large herd in this region. The Tiwa Pueblos were constructed between 800 and 1598 in the Taos Valley. Um, the North and South Houses were constructed between 1000 CE and 1450. Um, and the North and South Houses were constructed at about the same time. Um, we do have a lot of archaeological evidence down at Pot Creek, which was built around 1150 to 1320, that they did practice some kind of irrigation techniques. They have archaeological evidence that there is some canal-like forms and structures that were created at that site. And a lot of these sites really were like just digging and finding where the water was flowing and routing that water and encouraging their dryland farming through that area. And so they did start to build canal-like structures during this time, what they call proto-irrigation canals um, that were found surrounding Paw Creek. 1598, the Spanish arrived. We know that that happened. Um, one of the legacies of Spain is the Ezequias system. Um, the Ezequias was a system of water canal and ditch building that they developed basically everywhere that the Spanish had colonized throughout New Spain is all of those regions. They created some kind of canal structure system that they brought with them. And so um, one of the first things they would do when they would establish a colony is immediately start to build the Ezequia Madres and start to build the secondary canal and, and Ezequia systems immediately. So that was one of the first things that were established. So we can say that the Ezequias here, uh, maybe not in their current formation, but the Ezequias here have been here as, as far back as 1598. Um, and a lot of these ditches were built on the backs of a lot of indigenous labor, forced labor as well. It's considered a tax by Spain. To give up some tax was to give time to help build these canals for the colonists. Um, the Great Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the Spanish were pushed back to El Paso. Um, this was a really significant event and it marked a significant change in the Spanish policies dealing with the Puebloan people. Um, they could no longer be pushed around the way that Spain pushed a lot of other cultures around. Um, the Pueblos here enjoy a different kind of freedom during that time than any other indigenous culture that was ruled under Spain at that time because of the Pueblo revolt. They effectively said, we're not going to take it. You better give us rights and you better treat us fairly. Right. And so that was one of the things that they had argued. And during the Spanish reconquest of 1692 under de Vargas, they did establish new land and water rights for the Pueblos that were more lenient than what they had been before. Although de Vargas um, historically sort of ruled a little bit more with an iron fist than, um, than what they would have liked. But those initial land and water rights for reconquest were renegotiated during the surrender of the Pueblos to Spain. 1743, Spain undergoes what's called the Bourbon Reforms. Their, um, their, uh, their kings and queens were starting to lose power at the time, and the church was starting to lose power at the time. And so Spain decided to enter into agreement with France. And so they were sort of intermingling with France, and the Bourbons in France came in and brought their ideologies into Spain, and they changed the way that Spain interacted with their colonies here in New Spain out in the Americas. So under the Bourbon reforms, the, the Bourbons said new system of economic government for the Americas. So they created a whole new way of thinking about their interactions with the Native Americans and with the colonies out here as well, which increased the autonomy of the local areas to control their own water rights. That was a big part of that agreement. Was it allowed the Hispanos that had been here and the indigenous communities to then have larger control of their water systems that was outside of the view of Spain. 1820, we have the Mexican Revolution. Um, during the Mexican Revolution, when this area became a part of Mexico, um, they had a transfer of water rights to the Pueblos and to the Hispanos. And especially to the Pueblos, they had what was called quote, giving them water access because they had had access to water since, quote, time immemorial, right? So this is one of the first in paper sort of transfers of water rights between one government to the other regarding the water rights here in the Taos Valley and throughout the Southwest. Um, 1846, we have the Mexican-American War. 
Um, New Mexico was declared a territory by the U.S. after pushing the Mexican army out. This, there were a lot of these battles that happened throughout the Southwest. There was some pretty intense fighting that happened here in the Taos Valley. A lot of the historic acequias and evidences of the Acequia Madre here were damaged during the battles of the Mexican-American War. The Pueblo Mission Church that had been rebuilt after the Pueblo Revolt was destroyed during a battle here um, between the Mexican and the American Army. So it was throughout this entire town. Um, 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, Article 8 says property of every kind will be transferred inviolably um, respected, right? So they basically said whatever the water rights and land rights that had happened before are going to continue on, right? So we're talking about the, the Spanish colonial water rights and land rights that then transferred to the Mexican land rights and water rights that then transferred to the American territorial land rights and water rights. And every time there was a transition in that, a little bit was lost here and someone else got a little bit more and more lawsuits had come between that throughout that entire time. So it's not like water rights lawsuits or something that is a recent thing. They extend all the way back through each time that this area was transferred to a new government. There were lawsuits with those governments surrounding the Asequia rights and the Pueblo rights of this area and what the state could control. 1895 Asequia associations were sort of ratified by the territorial government structure out here. Um, they gave three commissioners in a mayor domo, um, which was considered a corporate body, which can, quote, sue and be sued, right? So it gave the Asequias the ability to associate and create a court, sort of governing body over the Asequia systems here in New Mexico. In 1907, the Asequia Act, um, the government knew that they were going to make New Mexico a state, so they got ahead and started to develop a, a, some kind of water rights code in this region. So in 1907, they started the Asequia Act. Um, chapter 73 specifically talks about water rights and how the Asequias could be managed under that system. <coughs> Nineteen twelve, New Mexico was declared a state. When New Mexico was declared a state, this water rights code that they developed um, from 1907 was ratified and became the law of the land. 1914, just two years later, we have Snow versus Avalos, right? This is one of the first litigations that America had to deal with with the Asequias out here. Um, and this uh, lawsuit um, effectively was challenging and looking at the Asequia corporate powers, so the powers of the Asequia associations to actually have um, authority over the water management systems versus the state having control over the water management systems. Um, it also, through its ruling, um, uh, created a couple key things that still persist today. First, the ditch owned and operated by the Asequia systems, giving the Asequias as a corporation full control over management of the water systems and the Asequias themselves. But it also established the water rights to the landowners or the parcientes, right? So giving each of the individual farmers rights to their water, but the Asequia associations over the ditches themselves. Um, it also created the power rank system that we have, um, which said, quote, beneficial and harms neither party, meaning that they would create a ranking system over who had water first, who should have the most water, and then who then subsequently after that gets certain amounts of water that's released by the Asequias. So that power rank system gave the Pueblos first power, and it also gave them access to as much water as they wanted. And then from there, it came down to the Hispanic communities, and from there, the rest would be divvied up to the state and all the subsequent um, communities that relied on the water system below that. 1966, we have the Rio Nambe Pohuake Tezuke Stream System Adjudication. Um, and this looked specifically to determine the water rights of the Pueblos. So this was a challenge of the Pueblos to have water rights and what their rights would be as far as state control versus federal control and Asequia control. So all of these different governing bodies wanted to have access and management of the water. And um, this, this was part of the problem that they had was they didn't have good laws that would help determine that yet. Um, a lot of these laws in this time took a really long time. 
So water rights laws are really complicated. And in some cases, some of these litigations are looking all the way back to the Spanish colonial water rights that were established under Spain. Because like I said before, when one government took over, they just said, we'll just keep doing whatever the previous government did, right? But they weren't very specific about it. And there were always changes that happened along the way to benefit one party or another. And so this um, Rio Nambe Powaki Tesuke system uh, adjudication really was looking at the legacy of that and where it would end up. In the 1970s, they started to build dams and ditches, and the state came in and claimed right to distribute water from Arroyo Seco when they built the dam. They moved the water from 30% to 18%, so cutting the water access rights almost in half of the people here. And because of that, it struck more lawsuits, right? The Rio Pohuake adjudication suit um, came in to determine the Pueblo water's rights, and that was all part of that Rio Nambe Pohuake Tesuke lawsuit. Um, these dams wound up becoming part of that whole adjudication. In 1986, the Taos water rights adjudication suit um, began the Abeta lawsuit. And if you've ever dealt with water here in New Mexico, or if you've ever looked at the history of the Ezequias, you're bound to run into the Abeta lawsuit. It was one of the most um, important lawsuits that happened out here that gave rights to the, to the local communities and to the Ezequias. So that was when the Abeta lawsuit started, it was in 1986. 1987, water rights and water banks, the state began to recognize uh, Ezequia Association power to acquire and own water rights. So this is when they gave the Ezequias the ability to actually purchase and own water rights. The reason they did that was because in the early 80s, there was this huge influx of people that came and started to buy land. And a lot of these people didn't understand the Ezequia systems that was out here. And so when uh, land would either um, fold because a family died or they no longer took care of the land or they would sell the land, the Ezequia Association could come in and purchase the water rights and to be able to hold on to the water rights and actually own the land of the ditches that the ditches were running on. So this gave power to the, to the Ezequias to own water rights. Created the New Mexico Ezequia Commission. So this was also important because it created this sort of statewide Ezequia Commission that would then <coughs> advise the governor, um, the ISC and the Army Corps of Engineers would all have to get input by the New Mexico Ezequia Commission before they could do any projects or change management in any way around water rights here. This is the last of it, I promise. In 2003, the legislature passed laws that the Ezequia Association can regulate uh, proposed water rights transfers relating to the Ezequias. So before this um, legislation, water rights by Ezequias were just based off of title and deeds, right? If you sold your title, you could just title deed your water out. Um, but they gave Ezequia associations the power to adopt into their bylaws the ability to regulate the water rights themselves. The state believed that the Ezequia associations on the ground had more knowledge and in-depth understanding of how the regionally specific water distribution systems were. We say Ezequias as if it's sort of this monolithic thing that is the same everywhere, but even here in the Taos Valley, each little pocket of Ezequia, each of those people have their own handshake agreements and understandings and water rights access and gate privileges. And there's all of these really complex structures that the state just had, they, they just got overwhelmed trying to maintain that. So they passed this and allowed the Ezequia associations to be able to manage the title and right transfers of water and allow the Ezequias to acquire those water transfers themselves as well. Um, in 2006, the Abeta settlement finally, finally finalized the 1986 suit of water rights. So 1986 to 2006, that's how complicated and long this litigation was. But it had a huge impact on the local area. And in fact, this lawsuit wound up um, going up to Congress and influence the 2010 Congress law. And I'll talk about that here in a second. So the Abeta settlement settled a few things, groundwater rights uh, um, among the different land grants that were here, and as well as a couple other things. The Taos Pueblo 
was given guaranteed to them um, their rights that were given to them by the Spanish colonial power. So they found that the laws of all of the transfers of power of water rights going all the way back to the Spanish territorial would be respected in relationship to the Pueblos themselves. So that was a big, that was a big deal. And specifically the Taos Pueblo and the uh, Picarese Pueblos. Um, the, they called, they, they went all the way back to the 1823 document, which was a litigation between when Mexico took over after the Mexican Civil War. They created a, what they called Reparto de Aguas, the division of waters. And so they went back to this document and that's as far back as they went um, for this Aveda settlement to determine Pueblo rights. Um, it protects the Taos Valley as sequias through ranked distribution. So again, it solidified that ranked distribution of water rights here. And because of this lawsuit, Congress felt like maybe it should step in because they are, in effect, the, the host and holders of the lands of the Pueblos, right? All indigenous land is held in trust by the federal government. So if we're making state laws surrounding this, the federal government definitely needs to step in at some point. So in 2010, the U.S. Congress passed the Amot Litigation Settlement Act in 1966, and it was adjudication for regional water rights in the Pawpawket Valley, but it did have larger meaning overall. So it created an interstate phase of Pueblo water rights, showing how internally within the Pueblos, they would be able to control and distribute their own water rights. And then after all of that would be finished, it would bring in an interstate phase of non-Indian water rights that would bring in a commission and look at how water rights are distributed in the acequias themselves. So that's sort of a brief history and there's still litigation. I mean, it's never gonna end, right? Like water is our most precious resource. And whenever there's competitions for this resource, there's always gonna be varying bodies of organizations and people that are going to be at odds with each other so it's something that's going to happen forever right it's been going on as long as people have occupied here it'll go on as uh, as long as people live here so what do i do as an artist one of the things that i think art can do is it can sort of synthesize information and it can synthesize information into action so as an artist, when I come to a place and I'm trying to make some artwork, like an, uh, like an artist in residency, like what we have here with the Paseo project, I think of a few different sort of objectives when I'm coming into a community. The thing that I don't want to do is be an artist that comes out here and just tells everybody what I think, and then just does an artwork based off of my own ideas, that putting artwork effectively on top of another community. So instead, I want to create artwork with the community incorporating the voices and the words and the ideas and the knowledge of that community and incorporating that into the project itself. Develop and share networks of community leaders. So one of the things I did when I came out here, before I came was I started to establish relationships and meetings with different community leaders and meet with different sort of water rights advocacy organizations, Taos Valley Aseki Association and other kinds of organizations and sort of talk about and mediate and figure out where all those organizations are and listen to them from their perspectives, right? Establish and utilize art networks and community to produce artwork. So the Paseo Project is an art network, right? The TCA is an art network. Finding all of these hubs where art is happening and using those communities and bringing them together through a singular art project that is in relationship to the community, right? Community outreach. This is really important in my practice. Again, I'm taking a lot of information in. All this historical research that I've been doing, I knew like some of this kind of like generally, I didn't know any of these specifics before coming out here. So why would I come and just develop all of this knowledge and information and then just leave, right? So one of the things I wanna do is plan activities where I can help the community synthesize some of the information that I've made. So community outreach, lectures, workshops, helps to synthesize that and then help the community create artworks outside of that. Things like this lecture here where I'm telling you all about the history of it. Um, coming up this weekend, I have a workshop at the Twirl Gallery where we're going to be bringing families in and they're going to be doing clay paintings and applying water and seeing how water can affect that and looking at maps and reflecting on the history of the geology and the landscape here and allowing kids and families to sort of understand what, what this world and this land is about. Um, I have a historical workshop that's going to be happening next Saturday as well at the Taos Library. 
Um, and so in that we're going to be, I'm going to be looking and bringing in the community and talking about how do you even find out about your history here? There's a lot of people here that don't even know where the resources are to find the documentation and the information because I'm a professional researcher. I know how to find these things. I know how to reach out to people, but a lot of this information is inaccessible to the local community just because they don't even know that it exists. So the advocacy and outreach and promotion of that is really important. And of course, the final artwork that I create, which is the pop-up show that I'm gonna have on June 2nd. So the final act here is to produce public artwork that incorporates everything that I learned, right? Bringing in the voices and the recordings of the people and the oral histories of the people that I've talked with, bringing in the information from the local communities, shooting video in local farms and, and local acequias and incorporating that into the artwork, bringing in the words of the community and incorporating that. Um, so all of that then becomes a part of the final artwork. So the Vignettes de Aguas pop-up exhibition is going to be June 2nd from 7.30, just right around when sun gets down, right? When it starts to get dark, you can usually see the video projections. Um, and that's going to be through downtown Taos and uh, through the Bent Street area. Um, but I'm going to have several different works that are going to be showing up around town through the next couple weeks as well. So if you happen to go into a restaurant or a bar and you see a video projection, somewhere in that bar that's looking at maps and looking at the history of water, that's probably part of this project. So it's about getting that information back out into the community as well, not just the one-time exhibition, but a continuous exhibition during my time here. Um, so what this projection mapping does is I take all of the stuff that I've learned and I make short videos and animations out of it. And then I use those animations to interact with the architecture of the area. So finding businesses, finding random walls and little places that make quaint little areas that I can then project these video animations back onto. So you should be able to walk around downtown and you'll see different projections in different places. And we're gonna figure out how to make a map of that so that way people can find all the locations um, during the exhibition. So projection mapping all of these videos onto different architectural sources throughout the area. So that's kind of what my project is gonna be and the culmination of it. I do want to give special thanks and recognition to all of the folks that have been kind enough to loan themselves and their information and their ear and their knowledge to me throughout this project. The Sale Project, the Taos Center for the Arts, Taos Library, the UNM Taos Library, um, the Revolt Gallery and the Coup de Taos, the Taos Valley Asequi Association, the Rolling Still Distillery and Lounge, Amigos Bravos, a special thanks to individuals, Sylvia Rodriguez. I went to her talk last weekend. She's a treasure in this area. She's one of the most knowledgeable people about the Asequias here. Um, I could listen to her forever, right? Um, Miguel San Stevenson, um, super awesome guy. Um, he's been really instrumental in understanding sort of the local community and how these Asequias relate to that. Um, Melissa Kenley, who in the, is in the Encore Gallery right now, has this beautiful work of charcoal on paper dealing with water and rain and glaciers. Really phenomenal work. If you're out there on Facebook land, I highly recommend you come in and see this work. Her work is amazing. Corilia Ortega, who's inviting me out to her Asequia and help her with her field. I'm gonna get out there and get my feet dirty. Um, hopefully I can get out to Miguel's farm as well. We're trying to arrange that. He might have an, a, a water run here coming soon and I might be a part of that. Um, and of course, the Paseo Project interns wouldn't be help. I wouldn't be able to do this without them. Um, it really does take a lot of feet in the ground and all of the people at the Paseo Project as well. Um, so thank you all for bringing me out here and, and letting me do what I do. Yeah, so I can open it up to any questions that you want me to have. I know that's a lot, right? Like I'm a teacher, so I'm just like, I'm gonna give you information. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, so if anybody wants me to talk about something or reiterate, help with some information. Yeah. Um, when you go to these different gallery exhibitions, mm -hmm. do you have to It takes time, right? Like whenever you're interacting with a community, you're never gonna just come out there and be like, hey, I'm an artist, you should talk to me, right? It's really hard. You have to build relationships. It really is about people, 
right? Finding relationships and finding where the best relationships can be and cultivating those relationships. Sometimes meetings work out, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it becomes an email conversation. Um, but for the most part, it's about starting with the hubs. And usually because I'm an artist, I start with the artist hubs and then utilize and leverage their associations. But I found other associations as well. The Amigos Bravos, I was talking with um, a wonderful representative of their organization who does water rights advocacy in this region as well. Um, I was out at the farmer's market last weekend just talking about my project and I've met so many people through that process. So just putting myself out there in the community, making yourself vulnerable and hearing the information, listening to some of the farmers in the region is really helpful. All right, I bumped it. Um, was really helpful, you know, like not everybody has a happy story about this stuff, right? And in the arts, we tend to want things to be buttoned up in neat little bows and to be happy. But the truth is like, these are real people's lives and real people's heritage and their families for generations. And so I can't come out here and just say what I think is gonna happen. It's important for me to listen to the community and, and find out who those people are, right? Um, so one person will tell me, oh, you need to talk to that person. And so I'll write my little email or reach out to them however that I can. And then they'll be like, oh, you need to talk to this person. So Sylvia Rodriguez, I didn't really know who she was before I came here, but everyone was like, oh, you're doing water in a second. You need to know her. And she happened to be giving a talk. And so I went to the library and I read her book. And so, um, you know, it happens that way. And so um, I think it's really important to just find out who the people are by listening to the people from here and then you can help reach out to those people and develop those relationships. Any other questions? About Asekia's water? Is there something you want um, viewers or participants to take away from what the project you do here at Taos? Yeah, I think the main sort of theme around what I'm doing is what I call the hidden histories, right? Um, we all know the Asekias are here. And if you talk to any Tauceno, you probably will run into a conversation about Asekias at one point or another. But I think a lot of times we forget where those histories come from and why we are where we are at this point. And the reason I spent so much time talking about the specific histories and timeline of water here is because it really is complicated, right? Like it's not an easy thing to digest. And there's also contradictory information out there as well, right? If you're talking to one organization or group, they may not have the same perspective as another one, right? So I think it's important to listen to everybody. And so what I would hope is that people would be able to engage in and understand water here and why the community is the way that it is and to help understand why water is distributed and why it's so passionate with the community here? Why is the community so passionate about water, right? And why is it so important to people here? Um, people climbing drill towers and occupying that space to prevent oil. The people here are passionate about it and they care deeply about the water rights here. And so, you know, helping people understand why that is. I wanted to say, personally, I moved here 25 years ago from the East Coast and get lots of land here and I, I had no idea what the second year was. Like, I just was like, oh, people would say, you know, water rights, I don't know, I, you know. And I think that it's such an extraordinary system that most of, that so many people don't know anything about. Yeah. So my family was from Bernalillo and they had an acequia on their farm. And so as long as I was little, every time it was, you know, this time of year, we'd be out there chopping the weeds in the ditch and maintaining all of the ports and making sure that there's no leaks in the, in the ditch banks and when the water would come we'd go and play in the mud right you take like the best like mud bath that you ever have in your life happened right when that asequia was coming through and the kids we were all just allowed to play in the water right as it was coming through and so i think those relationships for a lot of the local communities are really important right because we grew up maintaining the land and it's part of our part of our blood veins right it's part of the life and so um, it's important because especially in taos there's a large population that has been coming in for decades that knows nothing about the Asekias and the history that's here. And so it's important for me to help relay why people are so passionate about that because it's, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our life, right? We grew up with the systems and we have been instilled into us since very early on that this is the most important thing that we need because this is what maintains our life and livelihood.
Yes. You said at the outset, and no pressure, just you can choose to respond or not, um, that, that you really grapple with your own identity and it, as you do these projects. And I'm just curious if there's anything you want to share um, about what you learned about yourself and your identities. Um, as you just spoke about how you have relationships in this idea as well. And I'm just curious if it brought up anything yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why I do it. It's always sort of searching for a relationship with the land and yourself, right? And I think when we think about the different divisions and developments of the areas, that's that's us, right? My family has been here for hundreds of years. And because of that, I am like New Mexico, right? Like I am the very complicated political and social economic system that's here, right? That is me. I am a product of that, right? So um, my great grandmother was from the Nambe Pueblo. Um, my family comes from Santa Fe, from Bernalillo, from the Taos Valley. My great grandfather in Bernalillo helped build a lot of the acequias that are now used in the Hemis Pueblo. So like my family has been part of it and it has both been both as indigenous and as colonizer, right? And both as American. Um, and so all of those relationships are things that I'm having to mediate constantly. And so in doing these research that I have here, I am finding out a little bit more about myself as well and where I fit within that relationship of everything. So one of the things that we always wondered was why, why do we have French in us? So my grandma did her relationships and found out, oh yeah, we have a huge line of our lineage that's French from, the, from, Galis, or from uh, La Cienega. They helped settle the La Cienega area just south of, of Santa Fe. And that was mostly a French community. And we were trying to figure out why, and it was because they immigrated here during the Bourbon reforms. So it was at a time when France and Spain were coming together. And so I have Spanish, I have French, right? And, uh, and indigenous as well. And so why does that happen? And so doing these histories helps us understand a little bit more about that. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. It's not a question. But I just want to commend you. This is an extraordinary distillation of information and knowledge, especially in like a relatively short time frame up here. Um, yeah, I feel like this is what someone would do for their entire PhD project. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of what we do yeah. as artists, right? Yeah. Like we have to land somewhere and we got to hit it hard and then just try to make something the best that we can out of that. And, um, you know, I, I would just want to give a shout out to my wife who's at home in Florida with my kids right now, um, taking care of them with one arm. You know, she's a tremendous resource that gave me the time to be able to do this. And without her, the, me being here wouldn't even be possible. So I have the time to be able to do that away from family and away from any of those external pressures and just to come here and just dig my feet into the dirt and just try to make something happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben, so much. That was great. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. Thanks everyone there on the social media land and um, Come join us this Saturday. We have two events. We have uh, the Twirl Youth Studio um, at noon, as Ruben mentioned. And then we have at 3 p.m. at the Taos Public Library, we have our um, research, history research workshop with Ruben. Um, and then join us June 2nd for the projections uh, and we'll see you around town. Thank you. Thank you so much.